Hello there, it's a 13th century schizoid man with another video. Here we're at Cardiff Castle. Check that out. But Cardiff Castle didn't always look like this, and its origins go right back to the Roman era. It starts as a hill fort built by the Romans midway through the first century AD, forming the southern part of the border as said Romans pushed back the Siluris. The Siluris being a fierce and warlike tribe who resisted Roman occupation, but like many others, found themselves fighting the long defeat. Sure, they beat the Second Legion, but were eventually subdued. Though how they were subdued is pretty murky indeed, but subdued they were. It was quite a large fortification, forming a network of three forts, designed to push back the natives. It evolved over the centuries. Buildings were added to work iron, and more towers and more walls were needed, and no doubt due to the piracy that was occurring in the area. Then, during the 4th century, most likely when the Romans left Britain, the fort was simply abandoned. And thus, it was left to ruin. In the 9th century, the Vikings were raiding the Welsh coasts and settling in Cardiff, but appeared to have no need for an old Roman ruin. So let it be. Then came the Norman invasion in the 11th century. And as no sooner had William the Conqueror taken England, he advanced into Wales. And what began as a series of smaller incursions escalated into an invasion proper as he advanced into Wales with a huge army. Thus began the construction of castles, more often than not reusing the ruins of old Roman forts like the one at Cardiff. It wasn't an unprovoked invasion in William's eyes. The Welsh had rallied around the King of Gwynedd and Powys Bletin ap Cainvin, who had allied with King Harold, and fought a stiff resistance to the Norman invasion. And William was having none of it. Huh? He wasn't going to give up or let anyone down. He was deserting no one. It isn't known who actually built Cardiff Castle. Possibly it was William the Conqueror himself in 1081 during the first invasion. As it's known, he made a pilgrimage to St. David's, but it could have just as easily been built by Robert Fitzhammer, the Earl of Gloucester, ten years later in 1091, as we know he invaded Wales during the reign of William Rufus. A royal mint was operational in Cardiff during the Conqueror's reign, which suggests the castle had been built during this time, though there is no recorded evidence of the castle until Fitzhammer. Hence, we don't know. At this time, only the outer castle walls were built using the old Roman stone. The keep was a wooden affair. It was early days yet. But the settlement that had dwindled during the so-called Dark Ages had begun to increase. The town of Cardiff was back in the game. A quick thing on Robert Fitzhammer. According to legend, he had strange dreams around the time that William Rufus was killed on that dreadful hunting expedition, where he had his <coughs> accident. Dreams that apparently postponed the hunt. But alas, the king died anyway. Fitzhammer was apparently on that ill-fated hunt and was apparently the first to gather round the king's dead body. It was his cloak that covered the body as it was taken to Winchester. He was also fiercely loyal 
to the new king, Henry I, the youngest son of the Conqueror. In the early 12th century, Fitzhamon was fighting on the continent in Bayeux and suffered a horrible injury that eventually took his life in 1107. Having no sons to pass his lands onto, King Henry took over control of Cardiff Castle and passed them to his illegitimate son, Robert Fitzroy, who was only around 17, 18 years old at this point. He was quickly married to Fitzhamon's eldest daughter, Mabel. Before long, was made Earl of Gloucester. Things were looking good for Fitzroy. I will also bring up another character from this period, the eldest son of William the Conqueror. What, I hear you say? We all know that William Rufus died on a hunt. No, the Conqueror's eldest son, Robert Curtos. These days, it's always the eldest child of the king or queen who becomes the monarch. Wasn't always the case. Meet Robert of Normandy. Now he is William the Conqueror's eldest son. Due to quarrels with the family, he never became king. So do take that in mind. For the Conqueror didn't think his eldest son worthy of the crown. He passed it to his next son, Rufus. Now, Robert Curtos was still the Duke of Normandy at this point and quarrelled with his younger brother, King Henry. These clashes ended up with the defeat of Curthos, and he was imprisoned at Devizes Castle. The reason I mention him is because by 1130, Robert Curthos was moved from Devizes to Cardiff Castle. He would spend the remaining six years of his life here. A defeated man in his 80s, a shadow of his former self. And his brother, the king, he'll die the very next year plunging the kingdom into turmoil, as, due to the White Ship disaster, King Henry I had no male heirs, and an epic clash between Empress Matilda and Stephen of Blois racked the kingdoms. Robert Fitzroy, also known as Robert Consul, would hold Cardiff Castle all the way through the anarchy, and would serve his half-sister, Matilda, during this tumultuous period. Initially, there were clashes in Wales, but this seems to have petter out as Stephen moves the war out to the more focal point in England, as Matilda was winning the war, having defeated Stephen's larger forces at Lincoln. Stephen was captured and imprisoned at Bristol, Robert Fitzroy's stronghold. Unfortunately, only months later, Fitzroy himself was defeated during a rout of Winchester, a crushing defeat. Fitzroy was captured. Matilda couldn't possibly continue the war without her chief commander, so she made a decision that effectively cost her the war. She agreed to an exchange of prisoners. Stephen for Fitzroy. Thus the stalemate continued, and Matilda returned to Normandy. Fitzroy went with her, but he returned with a mighty army, and Matilda's son, Henry. It was time to take the fight to Stephen. But Robert was nearing the end of his life, spending his remaining years in Bristol. As for Cardiff, it wasn't without conflict, but the anarchy was beyond the border of Wales though the need for better defences was certainly a priority, as during the anarchy in the 1140s, the old wooden keep was replaced by the magnificent stone structure we see today, and other structures like walls were reinforced. This was a new castle for a new era, the Angevin period. Out of the ashes of the anarchy emerged a new king, the legendary Henry the Second. Gone was the dirt walkway that led to the castle keep. Now there was a solid wall 
dominating the entrance. Nowadays it lays in ruin, but you can imagine just how impressive this structure must have been. It was formidable, highly defensible. You can get an idea of what this looked like by looking at the stonework that crosses the moat to the keep. Narrow walled corridors leading the way, with towers forming a gateway between the two separate parts of the courtyard. Designed to keep the rebels out. By now, Robert Fitzroy, aka Robert Consul, the Lord of Glamorgan and the Earl of Gloucester had died, passing away in 1147. And his son, William Fitzrobert, took charge of the estates. But unlike his father, who spent most of his time in Bristol, William appears to have resided mainly at Cardiff Castle. Look at this, look at this. You can't come closer. This is an arrow slit. You can imagine the archer aiming through this. This is the vision you get, it's sort of aiming over there. This is defensible. Now, not all of Wales has been conquered by the Normans. Most were still under the control of native princes. Princes that made regular excursions into Norman territory and vice versa. The Welsh went by their own laws, which the Normans frequently broke, as they were trying to implement their own laws on the Welsh, often involving land disputes that always favoured the Normans. Other natives weren't too pleased. One such native was Iforbach, the Lord of Singenif, and he had grown fed up with this. And in 1158, he and a few men climbed the walls of Cardiff Castle using only their bare hands and broke into William Fitzroberts' solar. What a scallywag! There, the Welsh rebels kidnapped William and his family, taking them to a nearby woodland. We conquered the sector! We won! His demands were simple. He wanted his lands back, plus a little bit extra for good measure. Once the Normans promised not to push their luck with the Welsh, William and his family were released. Again, with all the other castles, you can tell where things were. Look at all the things there would have been. Would have become announced, there'd be beams, there'd be platforms, there'd be stairs. Yeah, you can just imagine what this used to look like. The family being William, his wife Hawis, and young son Robert. In 1166, William Fitzrobert's only son, Robert, died unexpectedly in his mid-teens. The cause of death is unknown, and Robert hadn't yet reached maturity. So once again, there is no male heir to pass the estate down to. So the king makes plans that the estate should pass to one of the daughters, and that daughter should eventually marry his youngest son, John. But William isn't just some random knight. He's the grandson of Henry I. And so is the king. And they are related. And this will cause problems later on when Isabella of Gloucester marries John. More on that later. Either way, William is content. Now, you've probably heard many arguments about spiral staircases and the defensive capability being put down to myth. However, the medieval mind was practical, especially when it comes to castles, their military installations, not a pleasure house. So they had to be defensive. And anyone who's been up and down them knows exactly how tactical they can be. It's sheer practicality. Uh, imagine you're an attacker. You've got your soul here, you're trying to get up these stairs. This is defensible. The defender has all of your advantage. Trying to get up here in full chain of mail, in full suit, no chance. At 
present, in the 1170s, William is fiercely loyal to the king and sides with Henry when his three sons, Henry, Richard and Geoffrey, rebel. Though he ends up being considered a liability and has to forfeit Bristol Castle in submission to the king, but a few years later he's back in the good books and is there when the royal rebellion is put down. Whew, I can see the pub from here. Just look at this view, everyone. Just look at that. You can't beat it. <laughs> just a full Grex back here. There. <laughs> you know you're in the UK. <laughs> Around this time, there were more uprisings in Wales. Uprisings that saw the death of a Norman martyr lord called Henry Fitzmiles. This martyr lord had a nephew, a young knight named William de Broas, and de Broas wanted revenge. He blamed him Cecil Abdifnal, Lord of Upper Gwent, for the murder. And for a while, de Broas had been seething, waiting for the right moment. Then, in 1175, de Broas invited Divnwell and two other Welsh lords for a Christmas feast, a joyous occasion to talk peace. Observing the old Welsh tradition of renewal of treaties and putting differences aside. Uh, but William de Broas had other plans and had the three men murdered in what would be named the Abergavenny Massacre. Uh, this might not be Cardiff, but it's close, and we've not finished with de Broas yet. William Fitzrobert himself will pass away in 1183, and so Cardiff Castle passes down to Henry II, who held on to the estate until the marriage between Isabel and Prince John, during which time Cardiff saw another rebellion this time for Morgan ap Caradog, the Lord of Afan, who set the town on fire, though the castle held out stubbornly, refusing to surrender, and before long Caradog was forced to retreat, as an army was sent from Bristol to save Cardiff. Oh, Where is that, Joe Biden? What? <laughs> There's a man on that, looks like Joe Biden. Henry decided to reinforce and repair the castle out of his own pocket because the castle had sustained the damage due to repeated native uprising. Although soon Henry himself would suffer the curse of father time and would pass away. Keeping with inheritance, the old king also saw the death of his first two sons, William and Henry, as well as Geoffrey, leaving only John and Richard. The former would marry Isabel of Gloucester and inherit the earldom of Gloucester along with Cardiff Castle, and the latter would inherit the kingdom. Though it was a loveless marriage, as it was decreed that due to close family ties, the two should never have sexual relations. Thankfully for Isabel, Richard wouldn't rule long, just ten years, during which time her husband tried to usurp the throne. And once Richard died of his wounds in France, John divorced her and married Isabella of Angoulême. He still kept her lands though, passing them to a nephew, Amory of Evreux. Though in 1202, Amory was in Normandy, fighting the French. During which time, on orders from King John, William de Broas, the ogre of Abergavenny, became Castellian of Cardiff Castle. The Welsh hated him and saw him controlling the castle as a slap in the face. The situation got worse because Dinfwell had a son, Cadwallader, a boy of just seven, 
and De Broas hunted down this boy and killed him without mercy. Now, De Broas won't hold Cardiff for long. As in 1203, he was put in charge of looking after Arthur of Brittany, a teen who also died in suspicious circumstances. After around five years, De Broas was replaced by Fox de Bru, King John's mercenary captain. Fox begins by repairing the castle, along with several others in the Welsh territories. And he gained a reputation among the natives for his ruthless approach to insurrection. And by this time, the friendship between de Broas and King John had broken down completely, and the controversial knight joins the rebels, allying with Llewellyn the Great. The castle would be returned briefly to Isabel of Gloucester in 1214 when she remarries, but only briefly, for she'll pass away in 1217, uh, just a year after her royal ex-husband. And the castle then passes on to Gilbert de Clare, another of Isabel's nephews. Though the de Clares never truly resided here, they were too focused on other estates. Gilbert's son, Richard, began construction works in the mid-13th century that improved the castle's defences, no doubt in response to the uprisings and wars during the reign of Henry III. But by now, the Normans were pushing the Welsh back, and the uprisings became more focused in the west and the north, rather than in Glamorgan. The nearby Caerphilly Castle was strong, pushing deeper into Wales and taking most of the flag. But all this really kicks off in 1277, when Henry III's son, Edward, declares war on Wales, namely Llewellyn, King of Gwynedd. Unlike before, this conflict would be different. Edward doesn't want peace, he wants conquest. Richard's son, Gilbert de Clare, the sixth Earl of Gloucester, currently holds Cardiff Castle and brings forth a mighty army to hold Glamorgan and the south of Wales. And while the English king builds a ring of castles in the north to put the nail in the coffin for the native Welsh. And it will be a bitter war that would eventually decide the future of Wales. And on the 11th of December, 1282, Llewellyn the Last would fall at the Battle of Orwen Bridge, while his army fled the slaughter. As Edward subdues the Welsh and ends the native line of royal succession. From now on, the Welsh royal title prince will only be held by the English king's firstborn son. Check this out. This is a trebuchet, the sort of thing that was around Edward the First era. That's a look. That's impressive. <laughs> Castles had erupted all over Wales and the Normans were brutally hammering any insurrection. It really was over. A better defeat. And thus begun the 14th century. Gilbert's son, another Gilbert, would be the last declared to hold Glamorgan and thus Cardiff Castle. In 1314, he would perish in Scotland during the Battle of Bannockburn, where the armies of King Edward II were utterly crushed by the Scots. Cardiff Castle entered a limbo for a brief period, held by Payne de Tuberville, Lord of Coetie and Sheriff of Glamorgan. He wasn't the most popular man in Wales, let's put it that way. And in 1315, a great and terrible famine struck the kingdom. A famine that would last three years. This soon provoked an uprising from the starving Welsh 
led by Llewellyn Bren. Payne was given instructions to bolster the castle and strengthen it against attack, as well as lift the siege at Caerphilly. And by the end of 1316, he was recalled and replaced as Castilian by John Giffard. Giffard was responsible for much of the building work and the castle will evolve during the 14th century. But in 1317, King Edward II handed the castle to his favourite, Hugh Dispenser, a controversial figure. A dispenser put down this rebellion brutally and Llewellyn Bren was caught and sent to the Black Tower here in Cardiff Castle. Then he was hung, drawn and quartered in these very grounds. A horrible death. This caused a massive amount of controversy from both sides. So Dispenser looked for a scapegoat. He found one in the form of William Flamingi and had him also imprisoned in the Black Tower before him being executed, most likely hanged. All this did was create more controversy, which added fuel to the fire when the Dispenser War broke out. During the conflict with the other martial lords, Cardiff Castle was raided and sacked. Though after the Battle of Boroughbridge, where Humphrey de Bourne died with a spear up his bum, the dispensers regained control of the castle. But it was all falling apart, and enemies of the king and his favourite were everywhere. And when they failed to rally support against Roger Mortimer and the Queen Isabella of France, the king and his favourite flee, ending up at Cardiff as a stopping point to Caerphilly. Meanwhile, Queen Isabella and Roger Mortimer had captured Bristol, along with the elder dispenser, the favourite's father, and executed him. Soon, Edward and the younger dispenser were found hiding at Caerphilly and were promptly arrested by Queen Isabella's forces. And Hugh Dispenser suffered the same fate as Llewellyn, hung, drawn and quartered. A traitor's death. <laughs> the irony. Then, when the young Edward III took power, Roger Mortimer was also hanged at Tyburn, London, and his body displayed as a warning. Cardiff Castle still remained in the hands of the Dispenser family, as Hugh had more than one son. Another Hugh Dispenser took the title of Lord of Glamorgan, the third creation of the title, but only after Eleanor de Clare kept the seat warm for a while. The Dispenser family would spend more time at Caerphilly rather than at Cardiff, though they would control Cardiff for the rest of the 14th century. The Dispensers even managed to create a law in 1340 that made the Constable of Cardiff Castle the Mayor of Cardiff, thus controlling the courts. Uprisings in Glamorgan were becoming few and far between during this period, as yes, there were insurrections, but in the further reaches of Wales, like what is known as the St. Valentine's Massacre, as in the north, Henry the Shetherford, an attorney for King Edward III, was ambushed and murdered by Welsh rebels. As the 14th century drew to a close, the ever-controversial dispensers found themselves in another pickle. You see, Edward III's son, the Black Prince, died, leaving a ten-year-old boy as the future king when Edward the third died. This ten-year-old boy was Richard II, but in 1399 he was deposed as Henry IV usurped the throne. Right, Thomas Dispenser didn't like this, not one bit, and tried a plot to put Richard back on the throne. Of the Epiphany Uprising, it failed, and Dispenser was beheaded at Bristol. But it's not anywhere near Cardiff. 
In fact, Cardiff wouldn't see any real action until the dawn of the 15th century, when Owain Grindua rises in the north, the last Welshman to ever wear the title Prince of Wales. And his armies would come crashing down south, taking Harlech and Aberswithwith. A lot of Owain's troops had deep anger against the dispensers for the death of Llewellyn Wren all those years ago, and the Welsh would not forget what they did. And in 1404, Owain took Cardiff Castle by force, burning it to a shell, causing considerable damage. Owain repelled repeated attempts by Henry IV to dislodge this new Prince of Wales. I mean, besides, he got his own Prince of Wales, his son, the future Henry V. Wales had again become a battleground. But it wouldn't last long, and Owain is defeated, fading into the murky depths of history, and his fate is unknown. And the Lordship of Glamorgan passed from the Dispensers to the Beauchamps. This time, the castle goes through a period of extensive rebuilding, including machulations, new towers, and the structure you see as you walk up to the keep. All the previous damage was still evident though, and it wouldn't be truly undone until the 16th century. Though, the Beauchamps would lose it eventually, and it hands over to Richard Neville, the Earl of Warwick. And then, last of all, after changing hands several times during the War of the Roses, from the Duke of Clarence to the Duke of Gloucester, Jasper Tudor takes the title. Then, after his passing in 1495, the title of Glamorgan ceases to be a march on ship and becomes the domain of the king. In this case, Henry Tudor. Cushy, my son. A different day and age was approaching the Renaissance. And in the reign of King Henry VIII, Cardiff Castle finds itself leased to Charles Somerset, the Earl of Worcester. But he won't be living here. Just another part of his extensive estate probably only popping in now and then, while on a jolly to Wales. Though, it's not only a military installation by now, but a prison, used to detain criminals, especially the infamous Black Tower. And Thomas Capper, Capper, not Crapper, this is not the guy that invented the bog, this is a heretic. And he was burned here on orders of Henry VIII. By the mid-16th century, William Herbert, the Earl of Pembroke, would purchase Cardiff Castle from the ill-fated Edward VI, and he is the one that finally erased all the damage made by Owen. The Herbert family would control the castle right through the Elizabethans all the way through to the Civil War. Herbert would side with Cromwell during the Civil War, well, the parliamentarians, so King Charles confiscated the lands. Sir Anthony Mansell kept the seat warm for the Herberts during this period. <laughs> Apparently, the King himself was to reside in Cardiff briefly, after his defeat at Naseby, meeting with Welsh leaders before gathering his wits and heading back into the war. Either way, the castle switched sides, much to the anger of local residents, who demanded the castle given back. The King co towed to an extent, he retreated his garrison and replaced it with a local Glamorgan garrison. Soon there'd be the Battle of St Fagans, close to Cardiff, where the Royalist forces were soundly defeated. Thankfully, when Parliament recaptured the castle, they didn't destroy it like they had so many others, and it was handed back to the Herberts. Thus, the Herbert family would preside at Cardiff fall well into the 18th century, where Charlotte, having married a Windsor, meant her son was a Windsor and it passed to the Windsors, and then to John Stuart and the Marquess of Boot, a peer. And during the Georgian period, the castle goes through many renovations, and much of the old Tudor buildings were torn down and newer, more plush ones added. But this was no longer a military installation, nor a prison, but a pleasure house, fit for the 18th century aristocracy and the boots would hold it all the way through the Victorian era, which saw even more extensive rebuilding, including the clock tower I keep showing. 
and the boots held the castle until the 1930s, where they sold it off to be nationalised. And during the Second World War, the castle and underground tunnels were used as an air raid shelter for the citizens of Cardiff. People packed into these cramped spaces while German bombs dropped overhead. As you can tell, it's World War II and the Germans are dropping bombs on Cardiff. This is the blitz. You can hear the planes, you can hear the bombs. So, well. But thankfully, these days, it's a tourist attraction seen by people from all over the world. And quite a nice day out too. Thank you for watching. Well, we've just completed a, a nice day's filming in the Cardiff and Cardiff Castle. So we're in the pub with a nice ale. So, uh, lovely.